in the name of Jesus the Christ we come. God, we honor you, we praise you, we bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege, Father God, to come before you. Lord, we ask you to forgive us for our sins. For Lord, we messed up, we've fallen short. God, we have not been righteous before a righteous God. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us to be redeemed Bless us to be bought back and brought back. Bless us, Father God, that we will be about your business, that your will will be done, that we will repent of our sins and turn from our evil ways, that we will face heaven, we will face you, and we will face those things that we confront with and look to Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless this day. Keep us focused, keep us in your will, keep us in your way. Bless us to dedicate this last Sunday to you and to you alone. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us as we go forth in your word. Bless your word to fall on good soil. And bless us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. To the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus and Christ, we pray. And we ask it all. Amen and thank God. God for another privilege. We worship you. We worship you. We worship you, Lord. We thank you. Let me call your attention to Zephaniah chapter 3 in the Old Testament. The book is Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3, one verse, verse number 17. Zephaniah in the Old Testament. Zephaniah chapter 3, one of those prophets that preaches doom and gloom, and then all of a sudden, he gives us hope. Zephaniah chapter 3, 
verse number 17. Zephaniah, chapter 3, verse number 17. If you go to the end of the Old Testament and bag into it, you run right into Zephaniah. Zephaniah, chapter 3, uh, <coughs> verse number 17. If you go to the end of the Old Testament, you run into Malachi, Zechariah, you back into Haggai, then Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3, one verse. I thought that we needed some encouragement here today as we look toward the end of this year. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse number 17. When you found it, you discover these words. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. Zephaniah chapter 3, verse number 17. Let me read that again. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one will save you. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. I want to talk about God will make it right. Amen. God will make it right. God will make it right. When we look at the text, we find ourselves in a similar situation as those of Israel and those of Judah. The Jews, the Israelites, had found themselves in hopeless situation. They were there not because of what God had done, but they were there because of what they had done. The prophet Zephaniah oftentimes gave a message of doom and gloom. He was a prophet that told it like it was. Zephaniah uh, had the audacity to report to the Jews, to report to the nation of Israel, to report to the nation of Judah, that God going to get you. <laughs> he had the honor. He had the privilege. He had an opportunity. To tell them. The day of the Lord. Is coming. And this dreadful day of the Lord. Is one. That is going to come with terrible judgment. The Israelites had act like pagan people. They act like those who didn't know God. This is a warning to all of us this morning. If we know God, we ought to act like we know God. If we know God, we ought to carry ourselves in a manner where it is obvious that we know God. If we know God. If God has redeemed us, if God has bought us back, if God has brought us back, we ought to carry ourselves like we know God. But these Israelites had turned their backs against God. And as a sense of punishment, God allowed their enemies to run over them. These Israelites had scarced God's laws. They, they had burned it up. They worshiped false gods 
and they sin without remorse. These Israelites, God's chosen people, some would call them God's special people, had come to a point in their lives where they carried themselves like they didn't know God. Zephaniah reports to them today that there's some days coming and these days that you see now, they are terrible days and they're going to get worse. Zephaniah, being an honest prophet, told them that they need to turn back to God in order to have a ray of hope. Yeah, what we see in today's world is a need for a ray of hope. Mm -hmm. We need some hope in the midst of this pandemic. We need hope. Yes, we need hope <clears throat> in the midst of being oppressed and depressed. We need hope because uh, our lives are not what they used to be. Yes, and our lives have taken a spiral down we have seen in this pandemic where people are going without food and the federal government does not care. In this life in which we live today as we didn't know it last year, we find people who are being moved out of their houses. They are losing hope. Zephaniah has the same situation where people had gotten complacent. They had gotten settled and they had forsaken God. If we in these great United States of America is going to build back better again, we must not forget God. Look at, look at what Zephaniah talks about in chapter 1. He, he says in chapter 1 and verse number 4 and verse number 14 and verse number 15, he says, the great day of the Lord is near. Let me just warn you, when, when the text used the great day of the Lord is near, they wanna, he wants to remind us that God is near us. And in the midst of reminding us that God is in the midst of, we got to get it right because God will make it right. Yes. He says the great day of the Lord is near. It is near and hasten quickens quickly. The noise of the Lord is bitter. Verse 15, verse number, chapter number 1, verse 15 of Zephaniah says, That day is a day of wrath. It is a day of trouble. It is a day of distress. That day of the Lord is not a great getting up morning day. That great day of the Lord is a day of wrath. It's a day of trouble. It's a day of distress. That day of the Lord is a day of devastation. It, that day of the Lord is a day of desolation. The day of the Lord is dark and it's gloomy. The day of the Lord is near. He says the day of the Lord is a day of cloudy days. It's the day of thick darkness. The day of the Lord is one that is a terrible day. One would think, one would think that if it's the day of the Lord, that it will be a day of rejoicing. But in chapter 1 of Zephaniah, he warns us that that day of the Lord is a day of wrath. Right. Let me tell you, we have a great God. We have the only true God. We have a God that blesses us and keeps us. We have a God that's better to us than we are to ourselves. We have a God that looks over us and watches over us all night long. But let me tell you, in the midst of his blessings, he has a wrath. The same God who blesses us in the morning can bring his wrath upon us by noonday. We have that great God on our hand. When we look at chapter 2 
Zephaniah calls us as he called that nation to repentance. He says, woe, in verse, verse number one, two, he says, woe to the inhabitants of the seacoast. Woe to the whole nation. The word of the Lord is against you. O oh, you Canaan, land of the Philistines, I will destroy you. God is telling you, even though I am a gracious God, even though I'm a God who blesses you, I will destroy you. You see, the Israelites looked forward to getting to Canaan land. They thought getting to Canaan land, all their sorrows will be over. Many of us who are saved, many of us who are born again, thought that once we got born again, we didn't have to deal with any troubles anymore. Let me tell you, you thought when you got to Canaan that all your problems will be gone. You thought like a miracle all your problems would disappear. But when they got to Canaan, they became like the Canaanites. They began to worship other gods. So he says, he says in verse number two of Zephaniah chapter two, he says, O Canaan, land of the Philistines, I will destroy you so there shall be no more inhabitants. Hmm. He warned them, he warns them that, that I will take you out. I am God. Yeah. He warns us as our mom and daddy used to warn us. I brought you into this world, and I will take you out of this world. So in chapter 1, he gives doom and gloom. And in chapter 2, he gives a declaration that he will destroy all the inhabitants. He says in verse number 9, Therefore, as I live, says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, surely Moab will be like Sodom. He says, surely Moab will be like Sodom, and the people of Amnon will be as Gomorrah. Run over with weeds. You will end up desolate. You will end up run over with reeds. You will end up a salt pit of perpetual desolation. Yeah. However, there ought to be a remnant. Yeah. However, I told you that that Zephaniah was one who not only preached doom and gloom, he always also gave a ray of hope. Herein is the message to every preacher, every teacher, regardless of what you teach or you preach, you need to understand that you need to leave the people with some hope. <laughs> regardless of how bad it is, regardless of how bad it's been, been done, regardless of what's been done to you, you need to leave the people with some hope. In chapter 3, he continues this onslaught in warning the people, woe to her who is rebellious and who is polluted. He says to us that we have become rebellious toward God. We have seen wrong and called it right. We have participated in wrong when we knew it was wrong. We have become a rebellious people even in the 21st century. But when he gets to verse number eight, he says that there has been a faithful remnant. There has been a residual of people that has chosen to repent of their sins. I want to say to you today, I want to say to you today, we have to repent of our sin. We, we have to call our sins out before the Lord and tell God, God, I messed up. And don't, don't go to God and say, God, you know what I've done. You need to make sure that you call on God and call your sin out before God and tell God where you messed up. Therefore, God says, wait on me. <laughs> there's a remnant. There's a remnant that's tied up with those who are doing wrong. <clears throat> there's a righteous remnant. There, there's a group of people who have decided I'm going to do it God's way. 
There's a group of people who have decided that I'm going to repent of my sin. I'm not going to walk around as if I have not sinned. I am not going to walk around with my pious self acting like I've never done anything wrong. I'm going to fall on my face, fall on my knees, lay prostrate before the Lord, and let the Lord know and tell the Lord that I have sinned and fallen short. God says that the earth shall be devoured with the fire of my jealousy. We serve a jealous God. But the good news is I know there's a remnant. I know that there's a group of people who have come to the conclusion that I'm going to go to God like David did. Lord, restore, restore unto me the joy of my salvation. You see, sin, sin has a problem. Sin has a problem that he offers all of us. Sin will take you further than you want to go. Sin will make you stay longer than you want to stay. And sin will cause you to pay more than you can afford to pay. Sin will always take us longer, uh, further than we wanted to go. Let me just share with you, I didn't mean to go that far. <laughs> Let me just share with you, I know you didn't mean to go that far. But sin takes us farther than we want to go. And I know once you realize that you were there, you didn't mean to take the shoes off. You didn't mean to get settled in. You didn't mean to get comfortable. But sin will make you stay longer than you want to stay. Sin. Sin has a captivating a force behind it. it. It draws one in because we have a sin nature. Sin has a way of pulling us in. And when sin pulls us in, we not even want to go that way. But once sin pulls us in, sin makes us stay there longer than we want to pay. Longer than we want to stay, longer than we want to stay. We, we intended to get out of there. We intended for this to be our last time. And sin kept us there all night long. Sin kept us there all day long. Sin has a way of drawing us in. In the text, we find out that sin has a way of corrupting a whole nation. And thirdly, when we got in sin, we, we got there and we didn't intend to get there. Sin take us where we don't want to go and we get more comfortable with, with sin. And thirdly, what we have to understand, we can't afford to pay for sin. Sin will make us pay more than we want to pay. For some, sin has caused them their very lives. For some, sin has caused us our children. For some, sin has caused us our marriages. For some, sin has called us, caused us our houses, our land. Sin has caused us our cars and our vehicles because sin will take you further than you intend to go. Sin will make you stay longer than you intended to stay. And sin will cost you more than you can afford to pay. I'm going to get to verse number 12. Because God says there's a righteous remnant. Because there's somebody that's going to trust God. When we get to Zephaniah chapter 3 verse number 12. I will leave in your midst a meek and humble people. God has always called somebody to be able to stand humbly before God in the midst of Rome. God says that he will leave a meek and humble people and they shall trust the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. In 2020, if you made it to the last Sunday of the year, mm -hmm. you, if you didn't trust in him, today is a good day to trust in him. Yes. If you have not trusted in him with churches closed, you need to trust in him today. If you have not trusted in him, with people around us, over 330,000 people dead of one disease, not to count all the rest of the disease, you need to trust in the Lord. Amen. Millions upon millions upon millions globally have been affected. It's hard to keep up with the statistics. Because every time you turn on the TV or look at the internet, 10 minutes later, you turn it off. You turn it back on 30 minutes later, the numbers are keep climbing. 
Bible says that there need to be a remnant. In verse number 12, he says, there's a remnant of the meek, there's a remnant of the humble people who will trust the name of the Lord. Amen. Verse number 13 says, the remnant of Israel. The remnant of Israel, the, the little small group that's left. <laughs> The little small group that would do the right thing while others are going the wrong way. Verse 13, it says, the remnant of Israel shall do no unrighteousness. We run from unrighteousness. We, we move away from unrighteousness. We, we get away from people who are walking in unrighteousness. Then he says, and speak no lies. The other day I walked in, my wife walked watching TV and and I saw 50 amount of five. I said, she, he, he's lying. She said, how you know? You hadn't even heard a word. His mouth is moving. But the righteous, the remnant of God, will speak no lies. They won't mislead. The righteous, the people of God, will stay in the righteous lane. The righteous, the people of God, will walk with God and allow God to bless them. And keep them. The righteous, verse number 13, nor shall a deceitful tongue be found in their mouths. The righteous, you see, some folks say, Well, I didn't lie to you, but what you did was you planted a seed, and that seed was a seed of unrighteousness, and that seed will grow. They won't, they won't be deceitful. They, deceitful. They, they will not mislead you. They won't have a deceitful tongue. For they shall feed their flocks and lie down. In other words, when you're unrighteous, you can't even lie down. <laughs> when you're unrighteous, you're always watching behind your back. You're always looking around you. The wise writer says in, in, in 28 and 1 that the, 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 the unrighteous, the evil ones, the ones who are not righteous are always running from something and somebody and nobody's chasing them. It's, it's the, it is the symbol of when you get to a stop sign and, and you see a police car on the side just sitting there. He's not minding you. He's not doing anything to get your attention. He doesn't care about you going. But you get to that stop sign and you sit there for a good 30 seconds. It's because you want to make sure that he sees you stop and rock. You want to make sure that, that the police officer sees you. It is because when you're driving down the street and you see a cop, you automatically slow down. You're already driving five miles below the speed limit, but it's because you are used to being unrighteous that you are running when nobody is chasing. The text declares that, that you'll be able to lie down. You'll be able to feed your flock. You, you'll be able to lie down in peace. And no one shall make them afraid. He goes into verses number 14 through 17, and that's where I want to hang my hat tonight, today. He says, sing, daughters of Zion. Sing, daughter of Zion. Sing, begin to rejoice. Begin to have joy. All of this doom and gloom is for other people. He says, sing, daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. If you're in the remnant, if you're part of the residue, if you're part of the righteous crowd, you'll be able to sing when no one else can sing. The songwriter says, if, if the storm just keep on raging in my life, if it, if it does not stop, and my soul is anchored, and I'm going to rejoice because my soul is anchored in the Lord. Let me just share with you today, don't go and look for trouble. Don't, don't go and look for a reason to, to quiet down. Don't go and look for a reason to not shout unto the Lord. Jesus says, if these hold their peace, the rocks will cry out in their place. He says... Shout, O Israel, be glad and rejoice with, with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. 
the Lord taken, the Lord has taken away your judgment. Yes. Those who are righteous, those who are with the Lord, doesn't have to worry about being judged. <laughs> God forgives us for our sin. He forgives us for our shortcoming. He wants us to be able to rejoice. So he says, the Lord has taken away your judgment. He doesn't want to judge us. He wants to make sure that we are with him. God is in love with a backslider. He, he is looking for a backslider to come on home. God, God is in love with the black side. The backslider, the backslider. One man dis, de, de, describes the backslider as moonwalking. <laughs> he says, when you're backsliding, you're just moving away from God. You're just slowly dancing away. You're slowly moving away from God. <clears throat> you are in a backslidden position. But God is saying, come. Let us reason together. Amen. Though your sins be as scarlet, I can wash them whiter than snow. He has cast your enemies away. He has cast out your enemies. God has, has cast out your enemies. The reason why the writer brings up this text, this portion of the text, because the enemies of the Israelites were always putting them in check. The enemies of the Israelites were summoned by God to put them back in shape. When the Israelites got far from God, the enemy came up and put them in check. The pestilence showed up. Diseases showed up and put them in check. And, and one group of people, one little small group of people had so many complaints against the leader until God just opened up the earth and they dropped in and he closed it back up. God has a way of putting us in check. And they were seen no more. God has a way of putting us in check. He says, the king of Israel, the Lord, is your midst. He's in your midst. He is. He is in your midst. You shall see disaster no more. Those of us who walk with God, we don't have to fear the disaster anymore. Verse 16, in that day it shall be said to Jerusalem, do not fear. Zion, let not your hand be weak. We don't have to fear anything. We don't have to be fearful of anybody because God is in the midst. Look at verse number 17. Verse number 17, and I'll leave you alone. Verse number 17 declares, the Lord your God in your midst the mighty one will say. He just told us in verse number 16 that the Lord is in the midst. He just told us that God is present. He just told us God is in the, in the business, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of folk dying around us. God is still in the midst. I know it's hard. I know it's tough sometimes to when we look at 2020. It's tough sometimes to see God in the midst, but God always is in the midst of all that's going on and going around us. God is in the midst. We need to find out where God is. In the midst of trouble, in the midst of a pandemic, in the midst of oppression, in the midst of depression, in the midst of loneliness, we got to look for God because God is in the mix. And God is present. And God has appeared in the midst of all of us. The Lord your God. The Lord your God, the one who's in midst. The one who's present. The one who's on the scene. You see, some people think that because things bad are happening, God is not present. <laughs> I want to tell you this morning, if you're saved, if you're born again, if you're in the righteous crowd, if you're in the remnant of God, God is in the midst. And because he's in the midst, he is present. And because he's present, great thing is going to happen. He's present. See, some people looked this week for a present under the tree. Don't, don't look for the present on the, under the tree. Look for the presence of God in the mix. 
He is present. He is here. He is in the midst. He just, it's a good thing to know that God's here. <laughs> if I don't know anything else, if I don't know that anybody else is there, it's a good thing to know that God is in the mix. He's in the midst of us. He's in the mix of us. He's in the middle of us. He is present. He's not absent. It's a good thing to know that the Lord our God is, is present and he's not absent. When Satan is on your trail, when your enemies won't give you a break, it's good to know that God is in the midst. <laughs> when, when life is, is going down the tube fast, it's good to know that God is in the midst. When life has given you a raw deal and you have an unlucky hand, it's good to know that God is in the mix. I may be talking to somebody this morning who, who have spent every last one of their dimes. They, they have spent money trying to make sure that they can hit the lotto. And, and then when they hit the lotto, they have to bag up and look at how many dollars you spent before you hit the lotto. You don't have to gamble with God. God is present. You have to acknowledge him and turn back to him and God will move your enemies out of the way. The Lord your God in your midst, the mighty one. You see, the devil has claimed himself to be mighty, but he is not the mighty one. The devil and men have claimed themselves to have power, but they are not all powerful. The Lord himself, God himself, this word Lord, all capital letters, this word Lord simply means the self-existing God. He is God all by himself. He is the self-existing God. No one called him to be God. No one voted him, him, him in as God. No one selected him as God. He is the Lord God himself. He's in the midst. He's present, the mighty one. This word mighty comes from the same word we get the word almighty. This word almighty, this word almighty comes from the word uh, omnipotent. This word almighty is omnipotent. He is omnipotent. He is omnipotent. He is all powerful. He is almighty because he is the only one who's the mighty God. Let me tell you, I want to be in the presence of the almighty. I want to be in the presence of the almighty because when I'm in the presence of the almighty, my enemies can't do me no harm. Let me just stop and tell you today, the reason why all of us have not died, all of us have not been wiped out, all of us have not fallen under the wrath of God is because he's almighty, he's sovereign, he forgives, he does what he wants to do when he wants to do it, whenever he chooses to do it because he is the mighty one. He is the almighty God. And because he's almighty, he will save. The text declares he's mighty. He is the mighty one. He is almighty. He's omnipresent. He is all places at the same time. He is the one who will save. Now, let me share with you. If you, you got enemies on your trail, some people want to call on mama. You need to be calling on God. <laughs> You, you need to be calling on God because when mama tried to tell you to do right, you didn't want to do right. You walked out the door anyway. Big dog got behind you. No sense in calling on mama. You need to call on God. Your enemies are on your trail, and some people don't know when their enemies are in the present, but God knows we need to keep God with us so he can give us a spirit of knowing when we would not have known. The Lord your God in the midst, the mighty one, will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. This is the thing that really gives us hope. <laughs> God, because we've turned away from our sins, because we've turned back to God, because we are that select remnant that hang on to God and trust in God, look what God would do. God will rejoice over you with gladness. Not only will he rejoice over you with gladness, he will quiet you with his love. 
Things are in an uproar right now. Things are going terribly bad right now. I hate to be the, the prophet of doom and gloom because I know that there's good news today. <laughs> The good news today is God wants to rejoice over you. God wants to have gladness because of you. Amen. How, how can you make him glad? Repent of your sin. Go back to him and trust in him. God will rejoice over you. God will rejoice over you. God is going to make things right, I tell you. God wants to rejoice over you. He will quieten you with his love. He will quiet, he will, he will quiet you. He will quieten you with his love. You see, sometimes God rescues us from the storm. Other times, God calms us in the midst of the storm. Mm -hmm. if, if, if the, the songwriter says that if, if these storms don't cease, <laughs> my soul is anchored in the Lord. Billows may roll. The waves may get high, but it doesn't matter. I hold God and he is nearby. My soul is anchored. So if God doesn't calm the storm, he quiets the child of God in the midst of the storm. The storm may not cease. We're, we're used to Jesus standing on the ship, raising his hand and saying, peace be still, and the waves lay down like a baby and go to sleep. The wind stopped howling. Yes, I want it to happen like that too, but many times it does not happen that way. Many times God doesn't calm the storm. He calmed the child in the midst of the storm. And you're able to be at peace. And he calms you because he has love for you. He calms you with his love. Final part of that verse says, he will rejoice over you with singing. Throughout the Bible, throughout our churching experience, we've been told to sing songs unto the Lord. The psalmist says we ought to sing hymns. We ought to sing songs. We ought to rejoice unto the Lord. We ought to celebrate God every time we think about the goodness of God. Whether you're in the church or out the church, whether you're in the grocery store or in the food line, we ought to sing joyful songs unto the Lord. Amen. But here, the writer Zephaniah takes a turn. The writer doesn't tell us to sing unto the Lord like the psalmist does on many occasions. The writer here, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse number 17, the writer says, the Lord your God is in the midst. The Lord your God is the mighty one, and the Lord your God will save you. It says the Lord is the one that's performing the action. Many times the psalmist and in other portions of the Bible, we find the psalmist and other writers saying we need to rejoice in the Lord. But look at the text. The text declares that God will rejoice over you with gladness. Look at God. He's taking on the form uh, of a person. He, he, he personifies himself in the form of a person. God takes on the form of a person. And we know that God is a spirit, but because you turn back to him, this is what God will do for you. God, he will rejoice over you with gladness. God, he will quiet you. He will quiet you. He will keep you calm. And because of his love, he will keep you calm with his love. And finally, he will rejoice over you with singing. Thank God that he's rejoicing. <laughs> Thank God that he's willing to sing. <laughs> Thank God that he's willing to lift our spirits. Thank God that he's the one that's able to keep us and save us. On this last day, this last Sunday of 2020, the last Sunday preaching to you in 2020, you may not see me anymore, but that's all right because I'm going where the Lord <laughs> is singing. <laughs> Hallelujah. I am so glad that if I can't sing, I'm so glad if the choir won't let me sing, I'm going to meet my maker and God himself will sing over me. I'm so glad 
that God will have gladness with me. I'm so glad that God will come and quiet me. I'm so glad for the singing of God. I look forward to the, to the day that God will make it right. You don't have to, you don't have to connive. You don't have to sneak and jive. You, you don't have to trick anybody. One of these days, <laughs> Jesus himself have paid the price. One of these days, God will sing unto me. One of these days, God will sing unto gladness. One of these days, God will quieten the storm. Amen. He prepared this moment. He's talking about the Israelites walking into the new millennium. But one of these days, we will get to a point in our lives where our tongue will cleave to the roof of our mouths. They will fold our hands in service for the very last time. Folk will walk past us and see us, and they will say good things over us, and we can hear God singing on our behalf. Let me tell you, one of these days, people will lie for you. Now, while you're living, they're lying on you. One of these days, God will keep his promise. And God promised, oh, Zion, oh, Jerusalem, oh, remnant of God, keep singing unto the Lord. Because one of these days, the Lord is going to rejoice over you. He prepared this moment over 2,000 years ago. Jesus the Christ died on a skull hill called Calvary. Over 2,000 years ago, God gave his very best for you. He gave his very best for me. Over 2,000 years ago, he took his only begotten son, Jesus Christ himself, allowed mean men to kill him. Allowed mean men to hang him on a cross. He, over 2,000 years ago, God made it right. He will make it right. Jesus died for you on a skull hill called Calvary. He died, I tell you. He died until the S-U-N refused to sign. He died until the S-U-N refused to give off light. He died until the moon dripped down in blood. He died, I tell you. Amen. To one centurion soldier says, surely this must be the son of God. He died until one thief went to hell and the other thief went to heaven. He died, I tell you, on a skull hill called Calvary. They killed him that day. It, got, it became midnight at midday. It was dark that day. He died for our sins. They took him off the cross. I'm trying to tell you that God will make it right. They took him off the cross. They laid him in a borrowed tomb. It was a borrowed tomb because he didn't need it too long. It was a borrowed tomb because he was going to get up one day and give Joseph back his brand new tomb. He died, I tell you. He died until the earth reeled and rocked like a drunken man. He died. They took him off the cross. They laid him in a borrowed tomb. But the good news today, I told you the preacher, I, I told you the teacher ought to always leave you with some good news. The good news today that he didn't stay dead. He didn't stay buried. Out of that third day morning, he rose with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. He rose. He, he got up with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. He rose from the dead with all power Amen. in heaven and earth in his hand. That same Jesus called a cloud, went on back to heaven. He's sitting on the right hand of the Father waiting on you to repent for your sins so he can make intercessions for you and for me. Every time we mess up and we come around and confess our sins, he tells God, God, I died for him. He intercedes for us. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, pleading our case. That same Jesus one of these days, we don't know when, we don't know what time, we don't know what day, he's going to crack the sky. The dead in Christ who have this lively hope, who died in him shall rise first. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him in mid -air. The text declares that we will forever be with the Lord and the Lord will rejoice. He will sing. He will satisfy our soul. There was no satisfaction for God but through Jesus. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended.
you ought to come to Jesus just as you are. The door is open. The invitation is extended. There may be somebody today who has not trusted Jesus to be your Lord and to be your Savior. This is your moment. Why don't you trust him? The door is open. The, the, the door is open. The door is open. I, I give you this invitation. That Jesus is the Son of God. He died for your sins. He rose from the dead. Now is the time to invite him into your life to be different so he can rejoice with you. He can sing over you. If you're not saved, if you're not born again, you never received Jesus Christ as your life, in your life, you can do so right now. If you would, bow your head with me and invite Christ into your life. Repeat after me, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life. And make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you prayed that prayer, you're now born again. And we believe that you're on your way to heaven. Regardless of when you die, we believe that you, you're going to heaven to be with the the Lord we talk about. There may be others here who, who fit in the text, who is saved, but for some reason or the other, you have not been acting like you're saved. For some reason or the other, you have gotten to Canaan and you're acting like the Canaanites. Canaanites on your job, the Canaanites in your house, the Canaanites in your neighborhood, the Canaanites in your social circle. This is your moment. You can repent of your sins and tell God you want to change. You want to different. And let me just share with you, you don't have to wait till New Year's to make this resolution. You need to come to this resolution today. Because the new year is not promised to any of us. But the only thing that's promised is right now. The door of the church is open. You can repent of your sin and ask God to lead you, guide you, and direct you. I want to pray with you and pray for you. Lord God, for those who are listening, who have fallen short, who are saved and living in carnality and don't act like the same. I ask you to bless them to repentance. Bless them to know that God has saved them for the purpose of glorifying him. Now, Lord, we ask you to deliver them, rescue them, save them from themselves as you have saved them from sin. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. There may be some of you who, who are in between church homes. I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is the one who controls things, where Jesus is the captain, where Jesus is the center, where Jesus is the attraction. The door is open. Why don't you join? You can join by letter. You can join by Christian experience. Or you can join by salvation. If you've received Christ today, 
inbox me and let me know that you you receive Christ. If you want to join the New Beginning Church, inbox me or chat with me and let me know you want to join the New Beginning Church. But if you pray to be rededicated back to Christ and know that you haven't done things the right way, please, ma'am, please, sir, inbox me and let me know that you have rededicated yourself to Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for, for joining us. It is an opportunity to give to the Lord. This is an opportunity. It is offering time. But we've come to give to the Lord through tithes, offerings, and sacrificial gifts. This is your moment. This is your opportunity to give. Give your tithes. Give your offerings. And also you can give your gift to Jesus Christ for his birthday. Above your tithes. Above your offering. We want you to give to Jesus Christ for his birthday. You can do all of those by... First of all, Cash App. You can give by way of Cash App. Our cash tag is dollar sign NBC Souls. Dollar sign NBC Souls. Second way you can give is by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. The idea is... As we lift Jesus, he draws all men unto himself. Or you can mail your offering to P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. P.O. Box 503, Missouri City, Texas, 77459. Again, thank you for joining us here for our morning worship service. We have this service every Sunday morning at 10 45 a.m. You can join us also for Sunday school on Zoom on, on Facebook Live at 9 a.m. for Sunday school. And you can join us Wednesday night at 7.20 p.m. for Bible study. However, this Wednesday night we will not have Bible study. We will be preparing for our, our worship service for the end of the year, what many call watch night celebration. Uh, we will have communion that night. The time is from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. We will have communion. We will have testimonies. And it will be a virtual celebration. You will put your testimonies in the chat. Or your testimony will be placed on Facebook Live. And you can, you can contribute by way of testimony to the service. It will be an interactive service Thursday, December 31st. It will be an interactive service, and you can participate. Have your communion ready. Uh, have your testimony ready. We, you will type in your testimony, and we will interact and talk about it and praise the Lord for it. That's watch nights Thursday, December 31st from, from 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. After that service, doing that service, we will have communion. We will have communion. This coming year, I want us to embark upon another venture of the Word of God. I want everybody to, to embark upon this study with me of studying the Word of God. I hear you. Well, preacher, we already studied the Word. But this year, we want to, this coming year rather, we want to listen to the Bible. Get your gadgets out. We're going to listen to the Bible throughout the whole year. We're going to listen to the Bible, and we're going to journal what we pick up, what God is saying to us and what God is speaking to us uh, through those verses as we listen. Uh, I think it's, it's, it will, you will find that it will be much feasible to do if we listen to the Bible. I want you to sit down still. Listen to the Bible 
and we're going to do four chapters a day, four chapters a day. We're going to listen to the Bible. We're going to listen and we're going to have our pen and paper out and we're going to journal and write down what God is speaking to us. I think listening to the Bible may cause you to be more apt to do it because when you get to all of the begats, the begats, the begats, you struggle with uh, the Greek and the Hebrew, uh, it can become laborious. So let's listen to the Bible. Starting January 1st, we will start with Genesis chapter 1. 1, 2, 3, and 4 will be the first four chapters, and that will, have, that will take place on January 1st, 2021. January 1st, 2021, we will begin listening to the Bible. And the schedule of two, of four rather, the schedule of four chapters a day will, will get us around the middle of October. And then we will we'll take time at the end of October, from the middle to the end of October, to let everybody catch up who have, may have fallen behind. And then uh, we will do the New Testament again for November, December. So please, ma'am, please, sir, play, take it very seriously. We want to listen to the Bible together. If you are a friend, if you are a, an associate, or you are a member, or you just ha happen to pop in and listen to this video, uh, we want you to join us to, in listening to the Bible. And if you don't have a way to listen to it, contact me. Maybe I can help you out with it. You can use any version that you want to use. I will be using uh, uh, New Living Translation. I'll be using New Living Translation. I will still be preaching on Sunday with, with the New, Amer New, New King James, but I'm going to use the New Living Translation to, to, uh, to listen to during the day. Four chapters a day. Please join me. Four chapters a day, and I'm going to be journaling and writing down what the Lord has to say to me. I want you to do the same. Um, I think God can, can speak to all of us, and we'll be finished with the whole Bible by October, middle of October. Then we'll do the New Testament again, November and December. Amen. Four chapters a day, that's all I'm asking. Journal it and write it down. Make sure the Lord is speaking to you. Again, thank you so much for joining us here at the New Beginning Church, 4251. Sure, my road. Thank you so much for joining us. We're glad that you've joined us. Uh, that's 4251 Sure, my road, Houston, Texas, uh, 77048. Continue to join us on our live broadcast, both on Zoom as well as on Facebook Live. Thank you for being a part. We here at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, "In I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. John 12 and 32. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for calling us back to you. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us and willing to sing over us and, and bless us to be a part of you. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless us. We thank you for blessing us this year in the midst of hardship, in the midst of depression, in the midst of oppression. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for just keeping us and blessing us, Father God. We ask you, Father God, to continue to walk with us and stand by us and be a part of our lives. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen. Thank God. Thank you so much for joining us. Please come back and be with us. Uh, our next uh, time we meet is Thursday, December 31st at 8 p.m. Come back and join us and be a part of our service. Until then, God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.